Hi folks, Rob here from MTU's Black Rock Castle Observatory. Hope you've been having a great space week. And uh, what we're doing tonight uh, on October 7th at 9 p.m. is examining the sky outside as we see it in real time. Now, don't worry if you're looking at this a few days later, a lot of this will still be applicable. Try to go out around nine o'clock and the stars will be largely in the same place, but the planets and the moon will have moved pretty dramatically. But the rest of the video should still be useful to you. So the first thing you want to do um, is pick an easy starting point for reference, and that would probably be the moon. So if you can find the moon down here, it's in the southeast. Let's take a quick look at it, actually. You've got the man on the moon here. If you've got a decent pair of binoculars, you should be able to see this. So here's his head, here's his body, right leg, left leg is facing you. Uh, where his appendix would be is actually where Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon. So that's a cool little thing to be able to, to spot in the night sky. I'll show you why the moon is particularly useful uh, tonight, uh, a little bit later in this show. Uh, but what we want to do first is get our bearings, because we won't always have the moon to guide us. So what I want you to do, if you're outside, is turn completely around. And see if you can find this fairly familiar shape here. It looks a little bit like a saucepan or a question mark on its side. Now what you're looking at is the asterism called the Big Dipper or the Plough, or it has many names in many cultures, but uh, those are the two you're probably most familiar with here in Ireland. What you're actually looking at is the tail end of a larger constellation called Ursa Major. Ursa meaning bear, major meaning big, and it gets its name from this shape here. Now because of light pollution an awful lot of us don't actually see the stars that make up the four quarters of the bear here or its back legs. So you may only see this little section here at the back. But that's okay, that's the section that we're using to help navigate through the sky in any case. So I want you to treat it like it is in fact a saucepan. Come out here to the handle, work your way inwards to the body of the saucepan, and when you get to the bottom right corner There'll be two stars in a row just here. Go through them. And this first star that you come to, this very prominent star here, is called Polaris. That's the North Star. Now, if you zoom out, I'll show you exactly why the North Star is so useful. So it's still five to nine just here. I'm going to advance time a little bit, and I want you to watch the night sky. See how it rotates around that point, but that point stays fairly constant. That's why it's so useful. So once you've learned how to identify the North Star, you've got uh, an effective compass in the night sky at all times. And that's how you're gonna get your bearings when the moon isn't up to give you a hand. So I want you to turn back around again, look down here to the south, and the next thing we're gonna take a look at are some of the constellations. So over here near the moon, again, is probably an easy place to start. And this constellation over here is a little bit tricky to, to find, admittedly, but it's worth having a look for. So this is Pisces. So supposedly it looks a little bit like two fish jumping out of the water. And I'll show you some constellation arts to help your imagination along a little bit there. And you can see it does. It looks a little bit like that. But just to the left of it, you've got a much easier to spot constellation. This is Aries. Now, what's the story with all of these ones that are in a line here? They all sound very kind of famous to you, I guess. That's because they're the star signs. They sit on this elliptical right here. Now, what we're going to do in just a second is I'm going to get rid of the ground, and I'll use it to explain the idea of a star sign to you. So bear with me for one moment. Okay, so we've gotten rid of the ground. And we're traveling through this line here called the ecliptic. Along the way, we're passing by a lot of famous constellations. There's Aquarius, there's Capricorn. Over here, you've got Scorpio and Libra. And finally, over here, you've got Virgo. And the reason I'm stopping at Virgo is because the sun is in the way of Virgo. Now, traditionally, uh, when the idea of star signs was first conceived, your star sign was dictated by the constellation that was behind the sun when you were born. 
Now, what the people who came up with this idea didn't account for was a wobble in the Earth. That uh, It has a cycle that's about 25,000 years that it takes. But what it causes is an element of drifting. So when the, uh, the concept was first conceived, this star actually would have been over here. The sun, rather, would be right over here uh, on top of Libra. In fact, if you were born any time in the past couple of weeks or in the next couple of weeks, your star sign is a Libra, and the sun should still be there. So that's a loose idea of uh, how you get your, your star sign. You've got Leo over there as well in Cancer. Uh, and why the concept no longer works today, because the Earth does wobble. But admittedly, it would have been very difficult for anybody two and a half thousand years ago to know that or to account for it. But it's an interesting little factoid. Okay, so the next thing I want to show you guys how to find um, are some planets. Uh, believe it or not, you can actually see five planets with the naked eye. And uh, tonight, you should be able to see two of them. So, if you again find the moon, and look over to the left of it, you should see what looks like a very, very bright star. But that is actually the planet Jupiter. And if you have a decent pair of binoculars, uh, you can see a little bit more again. So I'll zoom in to give you an idea of what you would see with a decent pair of binoculars or a low powered um, telescope. So it should look like one slightly large circle with two or three other slightly smaller circles around it. What those slightly smaller circles are, are actually the Galilean moons. They're the, the four largest moons that were initially detected by Galileo Galilei. And so we can zoom in a little bit further here, and you can see there are actually a couple of extra moons. Uh, Jupiter is absolutely riddled with moons, um, somewhere in the region of 80, I believe. Uh, but it no longer has the most moons in our solar system. Saturn recently um, outpaced it uh, with the discovery of a few extra moons going around that particular beautiful ring planet. You can also see this beautiful red spot here on Jupiter if you've got a slightly better telescope. Um, it's one of the, along with the bands, is probably the, the feature it's best known for. Um, but yeah, like I said, all you really need to be able to see the, the four Galilean moons is a decent pair of uh, binoculars, if you're lucky. So we'll zoom out a little bit further again. And there's one other planet you should be able to see. Now, in the night sky, this one is going to look a little bit faint. And in fact, it's the furthest away of the planets that you can see with the naked eye. Um, so it is that little bit faint. But again, Saturn, very beautiful, very relatively easy to find. Jupiter is that bit easier. And if you did have a you know, a low powered telescope, what you might see is something like this here. So you can see like a little dot with a faint kind of a oval shape around it. And as you zoom in closer, you learn that that's actually the big beautiful ring that the planet is famous for. Now you won't see anything quite as beautiful as that through a uh, hobbyist telescope, I'm afraid, but it's still very impressive when you do see the little rings around the planet, even if they are quite small. So let's zoom back out again and get our bearings and try to find something a little bit trickier. A galaxy. So we're going to look up here. Now this one is something that you really do need pristine skies for. So you can just about see probably a little bit of a smudge here. Now that's about as much as you're going to see with the naked eye, if you're lucky. But what you're looking at here is the Andromeda galaxy. It's the nearest galaxy to us. It's stunningly beautiful, and if you can see it with a telescope, it's it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, you're not going to see anything quite as pretty as this with the naked eye, I'm afraid. Uh, but it is still just amazing to know that you can see a whole other galaxy out there in the night sky quite easily. But if you are looking to see a galaxy, there is one you can see quite comfortably with the naked eye if you're in the right location. And that's our own galaxy, the Milky Way. So to aid us in looking at this, I'm just going to briefly remove the atmosphere here. And that faint smoky banding that you're seeing going through the sky right there, that's the Milky Way. Now, unfortunately, it is very difficult for many of us to uh, get to a location where we can see this as uh, light pollution has become a very prevalent issue. It's blocking out our capacity to see the faintest stars in the sky. So obviously 
as astronomers, we, we want to tackle light pollution because we want to be able to see the, the full beauty of the night sky and to, to perform good studies. But there are many other reasons why we want to protect our night skies. And to uh, discuss that further, I'm going to invite Georgia McMillan uh, from Mayo Dark Sky Park and an expert on dark skies to have a little chat with us now. We've mentioned this light pollution issue and how it might stop you seeing the entire uh, beauty of the night sky in your area, but uh, we haven't really discussed what light pollution is. Um, and to get into the thick of that, we're going to talk to two experts from the Dark Sky Ireland group. We've got Professor Brian Espy and Georgia McMillan from Mayo Dark Sky Park as well. So hi, guys. Thanks for joining us today. Hello, everybody. Hi there. So I suppose the first question to ask uh, would be, what exactly is light pollution? Um, light pollution, I guess, in, in its simplest guise would be light that's, you know, not wanted. It's light that's going beyond its its useful area or useful time of use. Um, so it's uh, unintended light, if you like, in some ways. And it's, it's going to be a cost to the environment in, in some respect or create an impact on, on people in the neighborhood. Um, you know, in Dark Sky Ireland, we're not against light we're just uh, i guess the byline would be light done right uh, particularly in the time now we're aware of climate change biodiversity loss and energy use that and carbon uh, that we want to do things more efficiently and we've been focused heavily on energy efficiency and costs in the past and we want to bring the argument forward in a direction that the eu is actually heading which is towards reducing the level of light that we're producing because a lot of light goes beyond where it's intended, even with the with the best will in the world. And a lot of the time, maybe we're less aware of where the light is going. And, and we want to focus the arg argument on the unintended consequences of light, light traveling across boundaries, including into your neighbors, light traveling outside urban areas into the wider countryside that ha can have quite a large effect on, on dark areas uh, that we want to preserve, particularly, you know, as we have in the case of Georgia representing Mayo Dark Sky Park. Half the park is after dark. If we're just protecting, you know, the not building on the land or whatever, that's only doing part of the job. If we have light shining into the area, it's going to disturb the environment and the wildlife there. Very cool. And Georgia, so you're, you're with Mayo Dark Sky Park. Can you tell those of us who may not have had a chance to visit yet uh, what's so special about Mayo Dark Sky Park? Uh, well, Brian's pinched our strap line there. So half the park is after dark. It is a national park. Um, so it's Wild Nathan National Park um, in the heart of Mayo. And um, yeah, it's, it's a naturally dark space. So, you know, we don't have to do anything with that space. But what we do have to, uh, to look at is the surrounding areas where there's uh, more urban development and housing and uh, small industry going on. And that's where we're trying to work with communities, to work with our council, to look at lighting from a design perspective. So it's one thing to put artificial light in, but we don't always think about the consequences of it. Is it serving its purpose? Is it doing what it needs to be doing? And, and how much, and especially at the moment, how much energy is it using un unnecessarily? And all of that impacts our dark sky park in the middle there. So as Brian said, light travels um, until you put a lid on it. So we have to look at that. Very cool. I suppose like for us here at the observatory, we, we need clear skies if we're to do our jobs correctly. We need beautiful um, clear skies where we can see all the stars. Um, so it's very obvious to us why protecting against light pollution is um, is a good thing, but perhaps it wouldn't be as obvious to you know a member of the general public who doesn't have such a direct connection to the night sky. Can you maybe touch on why the general public might care about having access to their you know beauty of the night sky or just reduced light uh, pollution in their area? Yes, uh, I, I think we all have a, a duty of care to the environment around us, and I think we've become more sensitive to that over the time of COVID, where we've been denied access to the outdoors. You felt particularly badly, you know, when we're constrained within two kilometers of, the, of our home, and we really need to get out into the wider environment. Um, and it's becoming recognized now at the national level, as well as down at the local level, that, you know, there's a benefit to having dark sky areas. There's a benefit for engaging and reducing our stress levels and so on. But, you know, going into the dark environment is a natural state that we evolved with and living in the 24-7 culture is a much more recent phenomenon, primarily since around the mid, late 
19th century with the uh, production of cheap uh, light production and, and the introduction of electric light. And we all have, a, as I said, a duty of care responsibility, and we need to consider that our actions can affect people elsewhere and the environment elsewhere. And if we're not careful, we can destroy the pristine environments we still have left. But even better, you know, if we're careful, you know, we can have those environments, we can improve them because we can do simple things like reduce the amount of light. It gives us an immediate reduction in, in light pollution, unlike, unlike something like soil or water pollution, which could take ages to actually clear through the system. You know, if we turn a switch, we can turn off the light um, and we can reduce our impact. But, you know, we have a resource that we could actually spoil. Um, we have the dark sky areas down the Western seaboard, particularly, and it's something that the majority of, the, the, of Europe does not have. So it's become realized there's a great gain in tourism. It's bringing people in. You want to see the darkest skies. You're coming in off season or shoulder season. Um, and there's a, you know, a net financial benefit to the community, as we've seen with events such as the Mayo Dark Sky Festival. So uh, people come to see what we have that has been squandered, if you like, in other areas. It's, it's been steamrollered over in the, in the urge just to you know, have more businesses, have, have places open late, have them lit up, even when they're unoccupied. Um, you know, so there's a new, we should think of this new way of doing it and, and it protects the areas that we need to, to recharge our batteries. It, there are events we can do as a family that we can all engage in, but it also opens up the sky to us. Having a dark sky means we can wonder about the bigger picture. And as we've seen with things like the Hubble Space Telescope, the James Webb Telescope, just thinking, you know, being able to think about the fact that there might be other planets and life out there, it completely changes our perception of ourselves and our and the position of our planet, you know, and how much our, the stewardship is important to us. I think that's the important thing, the, the, the human connection, uh, Brian and, and, and Rob, you know, we've, we're losing that. Um, and there's so many young people now that have never seen a naturally dark sky. And if you think about, you know, um, okay, modern astronomy now, where we're at, where we are, we would never have got there if if we weren't able to see the ancient people, night sky um, of our past. So the cultural connection, the scientific connection, the stories, and you know the nocturnal environment. It's not all about you know making it a twenty four seven daylight environment. We need that little reset uh, as a human species, and and as does nature. And that's where I suppose the parks are really important. That you know we need to look at the nocturnal species, look at ourselves in darkness as well as, um, as well as, you know, daytime conditions. Yeah, and I think, you know, as I said, you know, the sharing of things and, and the, the opening up of our, our vistas, you know, we see it also with events such as have happened in, in, you know, with my own children down at the Dark Sky Festival, you know, counting meteors in August in the Perseids, mm -hmm. you know, the excitement of of seeing something that's momentary, used to looking at the sky. And that's a good change of pace is that you slowly realize that the earth is turning, the sky is slowly changing. Maybe the planets are coming in, into visibility and so on. But you also have these spontaneous or immediate events or even satellites, which which can be a vein and a, and a boon. Um, you know, there's a whole range of phenomena out there that maybe people don't know about or that they can actually see. You know, you see these tiny grains of sand coming in from the solar system and, you know, creating these big flashes of light or sometimes landing as, as meteorites. Um, you know, there's a whole range of things to be aware of that we're just shut off from in, in the city. And, you know, if you want to think about it, if you don't go out at night, you know, just think of the difference between, you know, where I am at the moment is, uh, you know, an overcast sky, you know, the difference between a clear sky and an overcast sky, it gives you that feeling of liberation or openness and in a light pollute environment, it's even more so because it's reminding you that, you know, somewhere else, you know, life goes on and it's busy, busy, busy. And when the sky clears, you just have this quiet and, and wide open space to really be awestruck by. Um, and it's, I would say, if you if you think the skies are dark, you know, particularly sometimes people say in the city, when I look up, the sky is dark. OK, if it's really dark, you should see stars. Um, in a city, we might only see about 100 stars, and there should be about five and a half thousand or so that, depending on your eyesight, that are visible in a dark sky. There's a huge difference um, between a really dark sky and, and one that you might think is, is, is the typical night sky. 
I do know from um, an environmental perspective that there is impacts on uh, species uh, when there is excessive light pollution. Uh, my own background was in zoology and I, I read that uh, frogs, for instance, in some parts of the United States are losing condition because they won't um, feed after a certain, uh, or until it's a certain level of darkness. And because that window is getting shorter and shorter, they're eating less and less food, they're putting on less weight, the number of eggs they're laying is decreasing season on season. Um, things like uh, sea turtles, you know, rely on the light of the moon or the stars to help guide them out to sea. And now with light pollution, that has been disrupted. And I think those particular cases are probably the most heavily cited in nature documentaries and stuff. So that's what people are aware of, these, uh, these foreign ones. But Georgia, you mentioned we have uh, nocturnal species here in uh, Ireland as well, up in Mayo Dark Sky Park. Uh, can you give an example of a few of those uh, nocturnal species that you guys have living in the park there with you? Yeah, I mean, one that people don't often think of, are, um, you know, we have a lot of rivers, um, we have the aquatic species, so we have salmon, salmonoids, we have silver eel that um, migrate on a new moon, so when it's it's dark um, in October sort of period, winter period. So when we put in artificial light and we create light barriers um, crossing, especially water bodies, we're preventing that migration. Um, so with our, you know, aquatic species are often overlooked and we have a lot of light uh, along the coast and we, you know, illuminate walkways by riversides and uh, things like that. There, there's a there's an impact to our species there. We also have in terms of nocturnal species, we have the pine martens, we have badgers, um, we have the um, obviously the bat species. We've nine species of bat in Ireland. Uh, we have a lot of those in, in Mayo Dark Sky Park. Bats people are aware of because uh, when you think of nighttime and owls, you think um, of, of those as typical species. But with the streetlights, especially, we're, we're diverting their food chains. So we're creating, um, I suppose, a, a food buzz for, for an attraction for moths and um, invertebrates and bringing only the bravest bats that can face um, brighter lights, um, like the pipistrelle, who can uh, are a little bit more attuned to uh, light so they will go after the the, um, the food source near a light but the likes of the lesser horseshoe bat is really light sensitive and that won't so you know we're we're, we're messing with predator prey relationships with food chains and that when you consider how many lights we have nationwide we've about 600,000 street lights just for instance that's massive if every light is on which it is on from dusk till dawn every night um, we're taking a lot of our insects out of you know the, the 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 first level food chain and we're not really yet calculating or up to date on what impact that's actually having on the the larger species at night i, I think that's there's some important points there and, and one that maybe people aren't really aware of is something that georgia mentioned is, is the light barriers so in the case of the fish for instance if you have a bridge over a river um, salmon are sensitive to light down to about a third of full moon light levels. So you say, okay, well, we've kept, you know, development away from the riverbank and it's quite dark. You know, unfortunately now we need to think as well, we put in greenways or paths and so on. A lot of the times they're lit for humans. We need to think okay. of the impact on the wildlife that live there that we go to see uh, mm -hmm. um, and that has an impact further up the chain. Um, but also in hedgerows, for instance, if we light the edge of a road, we may be blocking um, a suitable roosting area for bats, an old building maybe, from a, a forested area where there are insects and where the bats want to feed. And they might have to go a long way round to actually get to the feeding area. So you're incurring a cost and you say, well, you know, we need that for the path or there's an occasional uh, passerby, but it can have a huge impact on disturbing the web of nature that's there. And, and one of the things that I was really stunned by was someone in Birdwatch Ireland told me that in the center of the city, somebody had reported seeing a peregrine falcon hunting at night. Now, those birds depend heavily on eyesight because they're, they're quite a slight bird and they, they stoop and come down at high speed. They have to hit the target right. They don't want to injure themselves, mm -hmm. but they're feeling comfortable enough with the light levels as a daytime bird to be able to hunt. Uh, pigeons at night so the pigeons are around and the birds will stoop and, and catch them um, you know you're, you're getting bird, uh, daytime species at night um, and it, it's big change that we're, we're introducing to the system and maybe we say you know the, in the city we maybe we're just aware of the foxes but there are bats and so on around the cities as well
It's bizarre. Yeah, I hadn't heard of that. But as you say, uh, and George mentioned, like some species are better at adapting than others. And I guess if we're not careful, we'll end up at a slightly homogenized uh, ecosystem where we're just seeing two or three species that are well adapted and we're losing out on that biodiversity then. Yes. I mean, I, I think sometimes people are focused on the level and they say, well, there's still a lot of insects or animals. But what we need is the food chain. We need the different species, the biodiversity, I think. And, and that has come to the fore. And it's actually in our legislation now that we're needing to protect the biodiversity. We can't have a monoculture the same way as we can't make all the fields as agricultural and they're all grass or they're all wheat. Um, that would be uh, disastrous. And we saw even with taking out hedgerows, the impact that has up the food chain. So we need to be more aware um, particularly um, some of these things such as light and there was you know some recent discussion about the increase in blue light uh, that has been in the national press as well um, the impact may not be huge on some species um, and there are species that we wouldn't think of such as the swifts for instance that are crepuscular they, they come out at twilight like some of the bats um, but it's an extra stressor on top of everything else and you know yourself you know, sometimes it gets to this is the last straw, right? That suddenly it's too much to handle. And we could possibly be in the same position that as the climate changes and as the, the environment for these species, they're trying to adapt to the changes. We're on a fairly small island. So if we actually introduce extra stressors, there's really nowhere for the animals to, to go that's more isolated apart from some of our parks. But as the temperature increases, they, we're teetering on, a, on the brink perhaps. For some of these species altogether mm -hmm. it's not like see. other species can move in as you say you can't uh, just expect it to occur in the park <laughs> because the parks are isolated you need uh, connected habitat for a species to thrive you can't just fragment like that um i suppose one area we're all quite familiar with in terms of uh, the impacts of light pollution is uh, we, we've all done it at some stage where we've stayed up till the wee hours of the morning scrolling on twitter or whatever it is on your phone and then you try to go to sleep and you are absolutely wired and for some reason you just cannot get to sleep uh, and we've learned that that's in part that at least down to uh, the impact of the light that we're seeing late at night correct that is uh, true i think there's there's a lot to be said for the very smart uh, people and who design the apps that keep you clicking you know or, or notifications that require to be cleared um, they try to keep you engaged and, and you look at your kids doing things, you go like, well, they have the adults doing it as well. You know, oh, it's a news update. That, that's more important. Um, but it's, it's also the, the color of the light. So the, there's the activity level, you know, keeping your brain overstimulated. You're much better off doing something like reading a book and using your imagination and, and quietening the brain rather than, you know, oh, I'll stay with. There's another response. I just sent something. I'm waiting for a response. Um, but also the blue light content, if you use one of these uh, filters that changes with the time of day and it pulls out some of the blue content, blue light is used as a trigger to align our circadian system, our, our day-night cycle. Now, some of us have uh, longer natural cycles. So if we all went into a cave, some people would reset their clocks and would be maybe working on a 20, 28 hour day, for instance, as they're natural. And that now I'm tired, it's at the end of 28 hours. Um, and in general, those are people who are maybe the late owls, like myself, I'm an astronomer. Um, that would be the natural cycle. And other people might tire more easily. Now, what we all use is a, a blue light sensor in the eye. It's not part of our imaging system, but it actually aligns our, our body clock to the day-night cycle. So it's sensitive, ideally, to a blue sky, which is probably why in the winter times we're all a little bit sluggish. Mm -hmm. um, but in the morning time, if you've ever worked a night shift and you come out, when you see the sky, it's actually quite hard to go to sleep then after that. If you can get into bed before the sun comes up, it's a lot easier. So this blue light actually triggers our system and changes uh, the uh, melatonin in our system that actually organizes our whole, we have a whole orchestra of different organs in our body and they all are trying to do different things. So the master system is up in the pituitary and, and, and actually is like the conductor for the orchestra and keeps your, your stomach gastric juices kick in at a certain time and the, the quietening of the, the system, the, the relaxation, the muscles kick in at a certain time and so on. So it's, it's triggering the cycle and triggering the repair cycle of your body. So at night, your body repairs 
and is better able to deal with uh, infections or to clear out anything in your system like those free radicals. And if we have blue light, it's tricking our body to, to actually stay active um, more than it should be. So after exposure to strong blue light, particularly as things like our devices get bigger and we're holding them quite close to our face, most of the light we're seeing can be quite blue rich and it's having an impact then in our system. And it, even after you put it down for about an hour afterwards, your hormone levels haven't actually gone back to the nighttime level. And this has been uh, proven in the laboratory. If you give people colored glasses, for instance, you can sort of keep them in a perpetual state where they're not sensitive to blue. It's, it's uh, they settle back to a natural cycle. The yes. easiest way of doing it is, you know, put the phone down, listen to what you say to other people or your kids and put the phone down. But, you know, if you would need to use the phone after time, turn off the alarms, turn on the, the blue light filter and so on, but find something more relaxing to do just before bedtime. Interesting. And now, I mean, the, the phone at least is within our control. Um, you know, you, you can choose to, to not use it. What, what do you, what are the impacts if you're living somewhere where perhaps there is light bleeding into your bedroom, um, but you, you obviously don't have as much control over that, you know, maybe a, a municipal light or a, or a neighbor's light is, is streaming in. I mean, is that potentially harmful or is it something that we should be concerned about? Well, I think we definitely um, should be concerned about it because it's it's intruding on your, you, you know, your your home life. But um, we, in terms of the colour, we are working um, at Dark Sky Ireland. We're working um, to to raise awareness of the importance of colour temperature in our lighting. Um, so you mentioned earlier about the um, the peregrine falcon. Or Brian mentioned the the, the falcon um, swooping down and in 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 the city because it's so bright, and that's because of that. The level of blue rich lighting in um, in the, the the streetscapes. So, what we can do is look at the, there's a color temperature gauge called the Kelvin's. Uh, so, um, where it's uh, at the higher end, it's got more blue content, and when it's at the lower end, which is what we're aiming for, to so around 2700 is a good uh, visually warm looking temperature, um, and that's better for for not interfering with our biological clock and with uh, with nature's biological clock as well so it still creates an ambient type of light it's perfectly functional for what we need to do at night outside um, but it's not quite so <clears throat> excuse me it's not quite so bright and glaring yeah if you're, if you're looking for these type of lights as georgia said unfortunately the color temperature is an indication that technology has or the, the legislation hasn't kept up with technology it, it's basically how uh, what color would something be if we heated it up to that temperature so if you put it on the on the stove and turned it up it would go cherry red and go up to the colors so initially the low temperatures are the are the redder ones but if you go out to the shop for instance you'll see um led uh, bulbs if you like uh, now and they say warm white or cool white it's the warm white ones um they're akin to the about the same color as as the uh, halogen lights we were used to or you'd have in a shop because they have a good color reproduction. So you're not surprised when you go out into the daylight and your purple dress is blue or blue is purple or something. Uh, you know, it, it has a good color reproduction. It sounds quite low. It's a color, you know, as I said, it's warm white. It's it's sort of the natural color you'd ha presumably have in your house rather than the cool white, um, which would feel more, I don't know, I guess the easiest thing would be to say like a hospital setting or something or bright lights or the supermarket, yeah, we, we very bright, that. very blue. We say uh, in May of uh, think uh, Hugo uh, rather than cold it's so <laughs> <laughs> uh, for the lighting environment. But it does. It, it's true. I mean, but the, um, the 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 brighter the light, um, as I find walking at night quite a lot, and I do. Um, if it's very very bright and it's very white, it's going to create really dark shadows outside of that lighting area, and that's part of the problem that people think. Okay, oh now it's super dark there. I've got to light that space and it's you know it's catching so that we're lighting areas that we don't need to simply because the first light was so bright that it's created a, a, an artificial co a contrast that's that's so significant whereas if we mm -hmm. took it down a little bit in the beginning and we had a more um balanced um color tone then you know we wouldn't see so many shadows or su such dark shadows and I, I personally think that much safer for me as a as a female let's say to walk at night 
uh, rather than light streaming and, and visually illuminating me and then I can't see the shadows beyond those lights I'm now on you know target or vulnerable um, than I would be if if there was a much lower level of light and I could see the periphery hmm. uh, far easier and I do practice this and you know it's you know you've got to use uh, experience as well a lot of um, the fears about night at, at uh, and light at night are perhaps not tested I think um so I think you know it's perception rather than experience so we we need to have a, a look at that perhaps that is an excellent point and and it is so, so strange that the solution is is almost counterintuitive that you know you, when you can't see something you think the solution is more light but it is you know yourself as the light goes up your pupils dilate you can't see as much with the contrast uh, and I was really struck by that in my last home um the the neighbor introduced a uh, a really bright spotlight um, that I could see over the gate as I was walking back to my own little flat that was in a quite a dark area and it became so much harder to navigate the potholes that unfortunately riddled the the area because this extra light made it very difficult for me to see the darkness right in front of me uh, so that was when I first became aware of you know in practical terms uh, of just how extreme this effect can be of you know really bright light creating much stronger shadows yeah, there's actually a, a, a few things actually in what George has said and what you've said um, that maybe we should should pause for a moment there. One is, um, I think the general perception is that more light means safer. And we can see in the case sometimes of misplaced lights where you have a light beside a tree, for instance, as George has said, you get a huge dark shadow. Or now as we have cars with um, powerful LED headlights or even some of them are types of laser. Um, yes, you know, it's a great selling point for the car um, it maybe makes the driver feel safer, but for oncoming traffic, it's, you know, it's a curse. You, you can't see through it. And that is a number of things. One is uh, this intensity of the light, which people equate with safety. And it's the way our eyes work. It's not with intensity. It's with contrast. Because if you think about it, if we took a, a sheet of paper and put it up against a white wall, and had a really bright light on it, you wouldn't see the paper, right? It's not, it doesn't help you. But what you need, if you had a, a you know, a, a contrast of some sort, the paper was a little off white relative to the wall. You could see that at a lower level or with a slightly different color. Um, and what George is saying there, you know, talking about situational awareness as well is if we focus our light, um, it's doing a number of things. One is if it's bright enough, then uh, it's triggering our daytime vision. And in the cities of, you know, what's, you know, I, I find shocking is um, in the centers of the cities, we're not using any of our nighttime vision. In the residential areas, we're using a mix of day and night. But as we move to LEDs, they they have a component in the blue for the most part. Uh, and that's actually in a sensitive part of the, the spectrum for our night vision. So a lot of people say, well, they put in these lights, the council will say they're at the same level as we had before. Sometimes they're a little bit higher um, to allow for degradation. But a lot of the people would report them being brighter because what it's doing is, is we only uh, legally control the, the component in our daytime portion of the spectrum, the group blue, blue or green yellow part of the spectrum. But in the blue part of the spectrum, that affects our night vision. And that also has an impact then that we're leaving ourselves a little bit blind to the darkness because that's the thing we depend on. It's, it's about uh, you know, a factor of 50 or 100 more sensitive than our daytime vision. And if we're blinding ourselves, um, and particularly with oncoming traffic or looking towards lights, we have glare, that can be an issue, particularly for older people. Now that our population is aging, we're very aware of that in terms of retirement times and so on. But as your eyes age, they scatter more of this blue light. So we could be storing up a problem that we're actually gonna make it harder for the majority of our population to see clearly at low light levels. So reducing the light level and making it more uniform, spreading the light out, is actually a better response than, you know, as, as George has said, cold, it's having the spotlight in your eye, which everybody appreciates is physically uncomfortable when you get glare. So it's actually a debilitating effect, and particularly, you know, with oncoming traffic or with street lights in badly positioned, it actually, or, you know, I, I've seen people with the security lights outside their house, you're driving in, the light flicks on, I don't know how they park their car because they're driving into a bright light. Now they can't see around it. So in security terms, you've actually reduced your situational awareness of what's around you. You've actually hindered your visibility. And 
you know, for people who have the security lights, particularly if they go on when you're walking on the other side of the road, um, you know, I'm not going to look over there if I know that light's going to go off. So, you know, if I looked over, maybe I'd see someone there, but I, for the most part, I'd try and turn away because the lights are too bright mm. and restrictive. And, and in some cases, the lights are on when nobody's home. You know that. <laughs> you can see the car's not there. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm curious. Uh, again, I mentioned that I, was, I had a, a zoology background, and one concept we were always taught when it came to um, conservation is that it's really difficult to convince people to conserve something that they've never seen or that they, you know, they haven't encountered for themselves or seen the, the importance of. And I guess here in Ireland, unfortunately, a, a decent chunk of the population have just never seen a dark sky, so they don't know what it is we're trying to to save. So you mentioned that ecotourism perhaps is a, a way to get people out into those those areas. Are there any other ways that we can get people to experience a dark sky uh, for for some of them, perhaps for the first time, just so that they can see how important it is that we do save these beautiful areas? Yes, there are events. I mean, the, the picture behind me here was taken up in Nauth. We or, um, in conjunction with the Irish Astronomical Society, we organized sky stargazing events. Um, and I think they were oversubscribed. I think there were three events and they were all oversubscribed, even though the weather was sometimes a bit iffy. Um, and you can see in the background as well, the light on the clouds um, from Drada. Um, but it does give you people ex experience who see over my head is uh, Orion, the belt in Orion. Um, and, uh, you know, when we're recording this, this coming weekend, we're organizing an event down in Glendalough. Um, partly it's for the sky and partly it's for the night. Um, and even as we found in other years, Georgia will, will be able to tell you, um, even if it's overcast, there's still an incredible or partly cloudy, you know, see the clouds scudding across the moon. It's a different feeling, right? It, it, it opens you up um, because when it's dark and quiet, you read your senses to just reach out into the wider countryside. You, you hear for miles and, and you're seeing for, you know, millions of, of light years, you know, so you're, you're seeing distant things. So we can go out to the neighbor, neighboring parts of the, of the uh, urban areas. Um, there are other events organized. I know, again, the Irish Astronomic Society organizes events in the Phoenix Park. I think they had 1,500 people the last event. Wow. Um, and I think in Stevens Green and Astronomy Ireland has uh, a star barbecue every year in, or ha has been every year until the, the COVID and it's back again or was back again this year uh, down at Roundwood. So there are the peri-urban areas, the areas near the city where you can get a taster, if you like, and see, you know, in a controlled and, and guided fashion, you can see some of these events. And we're hoping to increase awareness and get, you know, as we encourage people to do these events, that people like the Park Service realize there's a demand uh, for something that people hadn't seen before. And I agree with you. I think David Attenborough has used the quote, you know, you will protect what you don't understand. You don't understand what you haven't seen. Um, that we need to get these connections there, but uh, hopefully, you know, we'll provide more events and make it more accessible. And finally, with the tourism, um, yes, it's not only the, you know, major tourism, the big spenders, if you like, uh, but also, you know, uh, domestic tourism, you know, taking a weekend away, going somewhere and just saying, well, we'll go and see what the Dark Sky Park is like, or there's events in the Dark Sky Festival, whatever, um, you know, getting a taster of that and realizing there might be something there that you can enjoy further but it's also sustainable because it, if you want to see a dark sky you're not going to stay in the middle of a town perhaps mm. um, it's going to be spread the money around the population and that actually supports our local communities and that's something that we're trying to develop further as well i think it's very important very cool. in terms of stability of, of our, uh, rural populations and george is that something that you've, you've started to see in mayo uh, you know through dark sky tourism is the is the yeah. money starting to bleed out into the local community? Are they starting to understand the value of this resource? Yeah, we ha we haven't done um, economic reports yet, but it is something that's on the radar. We're uh, here in Mayo. We're we're looking at um, a new planetarium and observatory to further down the road. So we're we're just um, investigating that at the moment. And I'm myself doing a study through the Irish Re Research Council on the impact of uh, the dark skies and the community and tourism. So um, it's. It's a lot. It's another I'm only first year at the minute, but uh, another couple of years uh, of, of research. But that is what I'm looking into as to, to how it's impacted and benefited the, the community. But 
we know from the festival that we have every every year that um, it certainly gathers at least three communities together. So it's between Newport, Mulrani and Valley Proy. So that's that's a really, really good spirited thing. It's totally community driven. It's not um, it's very much from the bottom up, which is unusual by itself. And in fact, our whole concept has come from not from an astronomy background, but from conservation and from communities who wanted to act to preserve the dark space, dark sky space. So again, you know, that that's um, I suppose unusual that it that it didn't come from an astronomy perspective, but we are now learning more. And I think, you know, education for young people is something that comes out of this, that we now have astronomy programs. We have um, uh, nature walks at night and, you know, other, it doesn't have to all, all, all be about astronomy. It could be music at night. It could be the lyrics. It could be poetry. We do Danta in the Dark, for instance, celebrating our darkness, not just the um, the skyscapes, because of, as you've said, you know, we do have cloud cover to contend with but there's something magical in a in a dark sky as well as just um you know a clear sky and and just to follow on from georgia although you know i think it's a, it's a great lack at the moment not having statistics we do know from other areas that have implemented dark sky areas of dark sky parks that it has made a major impact on the community particularly in those areas where you know there's not a big uh, industrial center for obvious reasons um, so it can make a quite a large proportional impact on the community while meeting the requirements of the park areas in, in terms of conservation and getting the message out there and then people are taking that back to their own environment of you know the power of one what can you do yourself maybe I don't need to leave the light on outside at night you know so there is a, a big impact and but we see it as a win-win-win that we're protecting, you know, by making people more aware of, of the night sky, protecting the night sky. Not only are you reducing your energy use and your carbon use, particularly at a time when, you know, how much light are we going to, or energy are we going to have uh, during the winter is going to be important. Um, so you're reducing your demand, you're reducing the balance of, uh, the imbalance of payments for the country. Um, but you're also creating a, a potential uh, money stream as well. So not only are you saving money, but you are actually setting the scene to actually generate funding and also in a sustainable way. As I said, maybe you want to stay in a bed and breakfast, particularly if you're domestic. You know, you've come from the city, you want to go for a nice urban environment, you work, walk out the door and you have a, even a sky like this overhead. Um, just the experiential effect, you know, experiences rather than ticking something that you could have done in any other town or any other city or even your hometown. Um, opening up and, and just discovering there's something inside you that you hadn't realized was there or you were missing. And it is a wonderful story. It reminds me of, um, I, I read this paper about how a whaling community somewhere near Hawaii, um, eventually, you know, they retired to the harpoons and then started taking those same boats out on whale watching expeditions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like you said, that same bed and breakfast that might've had the spotlight on outside in the middle of the countryside, realize there's value in bringing in customers who Want them to turn that light off so they can see the the beautiful night sky so the, the same people living in the community you know it's, it's not that some blow in is coming in and taking this opportunity away from them you're giving back a local resource to the local community and letting them uh you know yield a living from it which is it's, it's, a fantastic it's this, story it's this thing about stewardship i think you know again harking back to david attenborough i think it's he's made people more aware the, the case i think with light is is like the plastic bags we went from plastic bags blowing from most of the trees in Wicklow, you know, near Dublin, for instance, down to cleaning up the environment just because we could produce plastic cheaply and give it away. Didn't mean that we should, right? That there was an incentive to actually go the other way and improve the environment. And there'd been big changes there in a short period or even the smoking ban. You can actually change the mindset of people once it's explained why and once people can understand that it's actually in their own interests. But you have to give the the experience um, and, you know, ecotourism has become more important. But we have a stewardship. We all have to protect our planet. It starts at home and we work outwards. But, you know, if, if we destroy our planet, we're sitting in the and our countryside that we're sitting in the middle of, you know, our day to day environment, as we realize with COVID is is something that we we need to work on and need to become more aware of. This has been a fantastic chat. I could probably talk for hours more, but there's just such a wealth of information that anybody who's interested in this can uh, consume. Is there any uh, consolidated resource that would be good for people to go to? 
it's funny you should mention that. Um, we have a Dark Sky Ireland is in the process of rebranding and relaunching uh, its website. So we will have that available very soon, just uh, after Space Week. And thanks to the Heritage Council for providing the funding yeah, for that. Thank you. Um, yeah, we've been supported for um, a project or two projects uh, through the Heritage Council. So um, so we launch our, our new logo on our new website, um, as I said, just after Space Week. So dartsky.ie is the URL to look out for. Very cool. I'm sure we'll have a quick little preview of that added to the video um, towards the end. So guys, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I hope you've enjoyed Space Week yourselves. Is there any final call to action you would like people who are watching today to, to engage with or to consider going forward? Uh, maybe to engage in citizen science. I know yourselves are, are doing um, citizen science on sky watching and satellite mm -hmm. counting, yeah. and we've been doing something similar, but um, to support um, the, the same project. So, you know, when you are looking in the sky to, to try and assess different things, it's darkness, uh, meteors that you spot and satellites, uh, it's all useful data. So uh, maybe be proactive with that. Um, it's another incentive to get out as if we needed any more reason to get out at night. Uh, and I would, you know, just add again, the power of one, you know, think about your own house, have a look around. Do you have a light on outside for security? But no one's looking to see if anyone's there. I know I talked to someone who who is uh, was in the park service and uh, had a security light outside that left on when they weren't around and never thought about the fact it was shining into a, a woods. Um, you know, we all can look at things in a slightly different way and think about you know, do we need the spotlights on the trees in the garden? Most of that light's probably missing the trees, particularly in winter. And we're sitting indoors watching our television, getting hyperactive. I don't know. Um, I so, you know, it, that has a cost, even even if we're uh, producing that light more cheaply and saying, well, it's an LED bulb the last 20 years and, and I can afford to leave it on all night. Should you? Right. And are there things you can do to actually reduce it? Um, and one of the things I looked at is, is using the census data and, and SEAI data is um, if everybody used one out of the group of lights that they had in their house for outdoor lighting. Now, that's not the case, but if everybody did, the amount of light produced would dominate all the public lighting in the country. So we can have, because that is directed downwards and a lot of the secur security lights and so on are directed outwards or upwards. So that light travels more freely through the atmosphere. So just sit and think, you know, what can I do myself? You know, maybe you're thinking, Maybe I should use the car less, maybe get out and get more exercise. Maybe I should use lights less and get out and look at the sky. That's wonderful. Thanks so much, guys. Great food for thought. Rob, and, just one, um, one very quick thing. It'd be remiss of me not to uh, to give a plug to the Mayo Dark Sky Festival, 4th to the 6th of November. So <laughs> I'll be here. Uh... If you want to experience, you know, have a look online and, and come down and see some of the events. There's ranges of events for everybody. Absolutely. I've heard nothing but good things from colleagues who've been to that. So I highly recommend anybody that's watching at home make themselves available to go to see the Mayo Dark Sky Festival. Thanks for uh, having us. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, everyone. We will talk to you again soon. Okay, folks, as promised, here's a quick little preview of that beautiful new website from the Dark Sky Ireland crew. Absolutely stunning images from all around Ireland and our beautiful natural heritage here. All kinds of useful resources as well to explore. I'm not going to go into them too much because uh, we don't want to spoil it for you. And of course, you can find them on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram as well. So the web address is darksky.ie. If you want to find them on the social media, it's at darksky.ireland on each of the social media channels. Thanks again to Georgia and Brian for joining me, and I hope you have a great space week, guys.